This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. The X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Exxon Radio Show or endorsed in any manner by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, the Exxon Broadcast Network, its affiliated networks, stations, employees, or advertisers. All Hit Radio. Welcome to the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. Welcome back to the X-Zone, everyone. I am Rob McConnell. We're coming to you from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, on the X-Zone Broadcast Network and our growing family of satellite programming providers and affiliates around the world. If you'd like to find out more about the X-Zone, www.xzoneradiotv.com. And if you'd like to find out about the programming that's available to you 24-7, 365, on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. My guest this hour is Len Kasten, and Len is the author of Secret Journey to Planet Serpo, A True Story of Interplanetary Travel. On July 16, 1965, a massive alien spacecraft from the Zeta Reticuli star system landed at the Nevada test site north of Las Vegas. Following a plan set in motion by President Kennedy in 1962, the alien visitors, known as the Ebens, welcomed 12 astronaut-trained military personnel aboard their, their craft for the 10-month journey to their home planet Serpo, 39 light-years away. In November 2005, former and current members of the Defense Intelligence Agency, directed by Kennedy to organize the Serpo exchange program, came forward to reveal the operation, including the details from the 3,000-page debriefing of the seven members of the Serpo team, who returned after 13 years on the planet. Working with the DIA originators of the Serpo project and the diary kept by the expedition commander's commanding officer, Len Kasten chronicles the complete journey of these cosmic pioneers, including their remarkable stories of life on an alien planet, superluminal space travel, advanced knowledge of alien technologies. Uh, He reveals how the Ebens presented the U.S. with the Yellow Book, a complete history of the universe recorded holographically, allowing the reader to view actual scenes from prehistory to present. Len explains how the Ebens helped us reverse engineer their anti-gravity spacecraft and develop technology to solve our planet-wide energy problems, knowledge still classified. Exposing the truth of human alien intervention and interplanetary travel, Len Kasten reveals not only that the Ebens have returned to Earth eight times, but... Also, that our government continues to have an ongoing relationship with them, a relationship with potential to advance the human race into the future. Joining me now is Len Kasten. And Len, welcome back to the X Zone. How are you, sir? Thanks, Rob. Nice to be here. Nice to be with you. Len, take us back in time to how you became involved in the Planet Serpo project. Well, it all started at Laughlin in Nevada when I was at the UFO Congress. Uh, that was the uh, when Bob Brown was running the Congress. You may you may recall that. Yes. Um, and we had to get the shuttle back to Las Vegas Airport from Laughlin. And usually there were about six of us on that shuttle. This particular time, I was sharing it with Bill Ryan and others. Uh, 
and I was privy to listening to Bill talk about the Serpo story all the way from Laughlin all the way to the airport, to Las Vegas. And uh, believe me, I was very attentive to what he was saying, and I was able to ask him a lot of questions, and that's how I got the whole story firsthand from Bill. And you may know that Bill is the one that created the website, the, the, uh, the Serpo website, www.serpo.org, mm -hmm. which is still out there, by the way. And that's, that, that's what got me very interested, because I could, I could tell just the way he was answering the questions and speaking about it that this thing sounded very much like it was the real thing, that it was true. I could just tell that it was, because I was, t I was connecting it with other dots that I had already worked on. So uh, it, it, it made a lot of sense. And, and from that point on, uh, and that, that, was, that took place in 2005. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I started working on this story after that following year. Len, you and I have to take a short break. Uh, what is the website we can point people to to get more information about you, and how can they get a copy of Secret Journey to Planet Serpo, a true story of interplanetary travel? Okay, I've just revised my website. I've got a new, a new website out there. It's still under construction, but it's functioning. And that would be uh, www.et-secrethistory.net. And uh, it's, it's a basic website right now, but I'm slowly fleshing it out. Uh, the book's available on Amazon. It's on Barnes & Noble. You can get it at almost any bookstore, especially if it's a Barnes & Noble bookstore. Len Kasten is our special guest of this hour, Exonation. We're talking about Len's book entitled Secret Journey to Planet Serpo, a true story of interplanetary travel. And Len and I will be back on the other side of this break as we continue from our broadcast center here in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. I am Rob McConnell. This is the Exxon. Don't go away. Hi everyone, Rob McConnell here, and I wanted to spend a moment on internet streaming. Everybody has heard about internet streaming, but not many know much about it. Did you know the internet streams just about everything? Movies. From new releases to old classics. TV shows. Almost every show, every episode, and much more. But the question has always been, how do you do it? Well now, thanks to the folks at 123 Ready TV, I have the answer for you. They have developed a simple program app, 123 Ready TV, that you install on your Windows PC, Android smartphone, or Android tablet that can have you streaming like a pro in less than five minutes. You truly won't believe how much is available or how easy it is to do until you try. And for a one-time cost of only $19.99, since this product is a real winner. To learn more about 123 Ready TV, visit our website at www.xzbn.net. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network. Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. How would you like to be able to read other people's minds? Well, the next best thing is here. When you know how to read a person's name, you know how the person thinks, feels, and behaves. Each letter in our name holds a key to unlock our true essence. Our name contains both our gifts and challenges in this lifetime. Nemology Science discovers personality secrets hidden in the placement of the letters of our names, including the first and last impression people remember about us. Sharon shows us how to interpret the arrangement of letters as outlined in her book, Know the Name, Know the Person. Sharon Lynn Wyeth created Nemology Science after 18 years of research and testing her theories and has supported thousands of people around the world in understanding themselves and others better. You'll enjoy Sharon's unique teachings as she shares her system to learn the gifts behind your given birth name. Even if you don't like your birth name, there are jewels in this book. If you're thinking of changing your name, ready to name your child, or wanting to get along better with others, this is the book for you. 
If you'd like to improve your relationships and change your life for the better, get the book today, Know the Name, Know the Person, or visit www.knowthename.com. That's www.knowthename.com. Take a step back in time and discover old Florida cuisine at Marsh Landing Restaurant in Felsmere, Florida. Enjoy delicacies such as frog legs, gator tail, catfish, and swamp cabbage, or enjoy the more traditional cuisine such as hand-cut Angus steaks, ribs, and seafood. Join us for breakfast with a Southern Flair featuring sweet potato pancakes, biscuits and gravy, and much more. Planning a party? Marsh Landing's private dining rooms can accommodate groups from 8 to 80 people. While you visit, enjoy the historic pictures, artifacts, and stories that line the walls. Marsh Landing is truly a unique experience. Marsh Landing Restaurant, 44 North Broadway in historic downtown Felsmere. Or visit marshlandingrestaurant.com. Marsh Landing, Old Florida cuisine at its best. Len Caston is our guest. His website that is under construction and uh, being updated all the time is et-secrethistory.net. Len is one of the author of one of the most interesting books on extraterrestrial travel and inter- interplanetary travel. Secret Journey to Planet Serpo. A secret, I'm sorry, a true story of interplanetary travel. And it's available on Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, and other online retailers. All right, so we're, let, let's go back to July the 16th, 1965. And this is the date when the uh, spacecraft from Zeta Reticuli star system was supposed to have landed at the Nevada test site north of Las Vegas. Will that be Area 51? Well, more or less, yes. It's, it's adjacent to Area 51, okay. yeah. So you get this information uh, about this... this um, this ex- could we call it an exchange? Yes, it was an exchange program. Absolutely. Okay, so take us back to let take us back to July 16, 1965, based on the information that you have been able to establish about the Planet Serpo case. Well, that was the second. That was their second visit. Their first visit was in April of 1964. Uh, we thought that was going to be the one that they were going to pick up our 12 people. But when they arrived, they decided that they were not going to do that. Instead, they just took the bodies of the dead aliens of, uh, who were in the craft that crashed at Roswell. Uh, there, was one cr- there were two Roswell crashes, and there were a total of about 10 dead aliens in those two crashes. And what the one we call EBE number one lived for another five years until um, 1952. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there were 11 bodies that they took back at that point, and uh, that was the what I would call the, uh, that was more or less the introductory visit. Uh, so that would, but they decided at that point they were not going to take our 12 people, and they would come back in a year in, in July of 1965 to do the actual exchange program. But they did, they did uh, drop off their person at that point. So that was the ceremonial. We might call that the ceremonial visit because there was an exchange of gifts. They presented us at that time with uh, the yellow book, which turned out to be an incredible, incredible gift uh, to people of, of our planet. And, uh, but then they returned to their planet, and the promise was that they would come back in July of 1965, which they did. So our our 12 people had to go back to, um, they really had to go back to uh, more or less of an imprisonment for a year because they they were not allowed to mix and mingle with anybody else. They had to stay isolated for that whole year. So they had to go back to Leavenworth Prison, Mm -hmm. even though their accommodations were a little more comfortable than the average prisoner, but they were more or less kept there uh, until the aliens returned in 1965. It, it all, almost sounds as if it's, it parallels a bit of the, the movie that came out in November of 1977, Close Encounters of a Third Kind. 
Well, yeah, absolutely. In fact, I devoted a chapter on that in my book. Spielberg had the whole story. So the question is, how did he get the whole story? And the only, the only likely uh, explanation is that the same person that gave it to, gave it to um, uh, put it out on the website and gave it to Bill Ryan, more or less, mm-hmm. probably gave it also to Spielberg because he was anxious to get the story out there to the public. It was his belief. Uh, we, we call him, he, he calls himself anonymous, but uh, more, than, more than likely he was high up on the MJ-12 hierarchy. Uh, and it was his belief, which he voiced later, that he wanted this information out there. And so he was determined to get it out there. And uh, he first gave it to Spielberg to use to make the movie. And then, uh, more, then, he, then he also uh, gave the information to uh, Victor Martinez, who created the website. And Bill, Bill Ryan was the moderator, became the moderator of the website, which is still there, still out there. So, so on July 16, nineteen sixty-five, this was the second visit from from the uh, from the spacecraft from Zeta Reticuli. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. First one. Yeah. The first one, by the way, they made it. They made. They landed in the wrong place. They landed up near uh, further north of uh, Holloman Air Force Base, which was where the meeting was supposed to be, and that became the Lonnie Zamora incident, which you may know about. Where that, con- where the uh, policeman on the New, New Mexico State Police uh, was called to observe this spacecraft that had landed uh, north of uh, of Roswell, about 100 miles northwest of Roswell, and uh, when they got there, there were two aliens standing in front of the craft, which was a large egg-shaped craft, mm-hmm. and uh, that that was the first attempt they made. They then were they were told that they landed in the wrong place, so they found they finally found the right the right place. They can traverse all the way from Zeta, Zeta Reticuli to Earth, but they get lost when well, it they comes didn't have to the coordinates. The Earth coordinates correct. <laughs> they, first of all, we had to we had to change. You know, they have a different numbering system than we do. Okay, did. right. And different, of course, language was totally different. Uh, their language was almost impossible for our people to understand. And uh, it's very, very, unli- very uh, reasonable that they would have made that mistake. But they, they were, they got the communication quickly mm-hmm. that they had made a mistake, and they went back up and finally found uh, Holloman Air Force Base. So it wasn't Air for it wasn't Area Fifty One. It was Holloman, which I, I believe is just uh, uh, on the other side of Area Fifty One. No, no, no. Holloman is in south, the southern part of New Mexico. Okay. At Holloman Air Force Base, which is ne- actually near the Mexican border, uh, that was the first ag- agreed upon landing sp- uh, place, and that's where they landed there, and that's where the, the craft that made the mistake then uh, got back in, and they they found it again. They found it. Now that was the one in which they took on board their twelve, their eleven people, mm-hmm. and uh, told us they would be back in July of 1965. In July of '65, they they landed on the uh, uh, on the uh, Nevada test site. Gotcha. Right next, right next to Area 51. Now, did all of our astronauts come back? No, no, only seven. Seven returned. Twelve went. Seven came back. Three uh, three died. One died on the way to Serpo. Mm-hmm. He was a security man. And two died on Serpo three years later, and then two decided to remain there. They did not come back with the other astronauts. So seven, seven came back. Are there any of the original astronauts that are still alive today? No, I was told originally that the last one had died in Florida in 2002. Oh. But then I learned later by an update to the website that uh, that was a misleading information that he really stayed alive until 2011. And that's, that's when he died. He died in 2011. And uh, I believe he, he was also from Florida. What did we learn from the 13 years on Serpo? Well, it became the subject of a 3,000-page debriefing document. Mm-hmm. So we learned 3,000 pages worth of information. 
and I assume that would include uh, flora and fauna, technology, biotechnology. I mean, they were very liberal with information. They didn't withhold anything from us. Any question we asked them, any information we wanted while we were there, any place we wanted to go, they complied. Uh, and so that's, that's what filled up that 3,000-page book, which, by the way, is now in the vault at, uh, at Bowling Air Force Base in, in Washington. As far as I know, it could have been moved. I don't know. Did, that, did, was the book, that was the book that Anonymous used to uh, produce his emails that he sent to the website. He had access to that book, <clears throat> that debriefing document. So everything was in there. Did the astronauts bring anything back with them? That, that, oh, yeah, that, tremendous that, amount of stuff, that, yeah. Like what? Soil samples, soil samples uh, technology examples. It was shortly after they returned in 1978 that there was a, literally an explosion of technological advancement here on, on this planet. The, uh, the B-2 bomber began to be produced in 1978. Uh, so many other things. Kevlar. Well, Kevlar, of course, uh, we got from the, from the Roswell uh, aliens. Whoa, whoa, whoa. The Roswell aliens were from Serpo. Well, uh, can, I, can I just hold off here for a second? Because my uncle owns the patent on Kevlar. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, so I, I know Kevlar was actually developed here on Earth. So, yeah, of course. So why would we claim that the Kevlar was retrieved by the, you know, was from the Roswell crash when it had nothing to do with that? Well, are you familiar with, uh, with uh, the book The Day After Roswell by Colonel Corso? Uh, I, I, yes, I am familiar with it. Did you, have you read that book? Yes, I have. Okay, well, you know then that it was his job to take all the things that were found on the Roswell crash mm -hmm. disk and distribute them to American industry and let them take out the patents. But my uncle was in Canada. It's a Canadian-held patent. Well, that's okay. I mean, well, we had we have good relations with Canada at that time. They probably had some sort of agreement. The, the point is that uh, it, all, it originally came from the Roswell crashed disk. How do we know that for real, Ken? Well, let's see. Land. Who That's talked right. about it? I think Corso talked about it in, in great detail in, in the day after Roswell. I don't know if he mentioned Canada. Where, where in Canada are you saying it originated? The patent was, uh, let's see, my uncle lived in Ontario when he filed the patent. My uncle he is now the deceased. For Kevlar originally? Yeah. Was he involved at all with any of our secret uh, information? Nope. I don't know. There must have been something going on because we were we were talking to the Canadian people about a lot of a lot of trade secrets at that time. Hmm. And uh, in in fact, uh, in fact, he was in the textile industry, and Kevlar was used in bulletproof vests. And they, he also had a patent on a, a Kevlar blanket that was used that is still used by the. Um, different hydro companies that when they go down into these manholes with all these uh, high voltage wires and conduits that a Kevlar blanket is put down there to protect the men. Okay, uh, let's see. Incredibly strong. I'm looking at the, I'm looking at the serpo.org website here. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the explanation is on the website. Okay. I'll have to find that information for you, but sure. Kevlar was one of the the fiber was one of the one of the discoveries of the on the Roswell craft. Now, how it got to Canada, I don't know. But I'll see if I can find out for you before sure. we leave the show. All right, listen, I've got to take a commercial break. Please stand by. Exonation. Len Caston is our guest. www.et-secrethistory.net, and we're talking to Len this hour about his book, Secret Journey to the to Planet Serpo. A True Story of Interplanetary Travel. And Len and I will be back on the other side of this break as we continue here in the X-Zone from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away.
Hi everyone, Rob McConnell here and I wanted to spend a moment on internet streaming. Everybody has heard about internet streaming, but not many know much about it. Did you know the internet streams just about everything? Movies. From new releases to old classics. TV shows. Almost every show, every episode, and much more. But the question has always been, how do you do it? Well now, thanks to the folks at 123 Ready TV, I have the answer for you. They have developed a simple program app, 123 Ready TV, that you install on your Windows PC, Android smartphone, or Android tablet that can have you streaming like a pro in less than five minutes. You truly won't believe how much is available or how easy it is to do until you try. And for a one-time cost of only $19.99, this product is a real winner. To learn more about 123 Ready TV, visit our website at www.xzbn.net. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the x Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the x Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere. 24-7-365. True healing must address four levels, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual, for us to live joyful and productive lives. We tend to treat three of the four, leaving the spiritual languishing. If you're tired of the same dysfunctional patterns cropping up in your life, soul balancing is for you. Trixie Phelps, owner and founder of Soul Balancing, is a naturally gifted energy healer trained in numerous esoteric forms, including shamanism. Trixie has created a powerful modality that safely and effectively clears your energetic field. A soul balancing session can remove interference, heal trauma, and restore your hope. Contact Trixie for a life-changing long-distance session today, www.soulbalancing.world. There's a legend shared by many indigenous cultures of a time when the nations were cast to the four corners of the world. Each nation was given a body of sacred knowledge that held a different portion of the truth to preserve. True reality could not be known until all the nations reunited, combining the information. If a single one was missing, the world could not be reborn and darkness would prevail. The Science of Magic Radio is dedicated to reuniting the sacred knowledge. With the understanding, none of us has all the answers, but together we can open new perceptions and possibilities. Through our combined vision, the world can be reborn into a place where darkness no longer prevails. Join me, Gwilda Wiecka, and the Science of Magic daily on the Exxon Broadcast Network, xzbn.net, or visit us at thescienceofmagic.net. Len Kasten is our special guest, www.et-secrethistory.net. And uh, Len, I have to make a correction here. Um, my uncle did not 
does not have the patent for Kevlar. What he did was uh, he holds a patent as the inventor of a device for containing the force of an explosion, comprises a blanket or curtain of flexible material uh, that can be draped around a danger zone. The blanket or curtain comprises a plurality of layers of fabric, each layer having a tight, balanced, weaved, independently woven through a, uh, I'm sorry, from a tough, non-combustible yarn of at least 1,000 denier. The fabric is substantially interrupted by stitching it in a central zone intended to make the main force of the explosion. The fabrics are bound together at their edges uh, with a border of tough material extending around the periphery of the blanket or curtain. The, num the, pri the main material used, Kevlar. And that patent is number 4780351, and it was granted on October the 25th, 1988. Now, subsequent, uh, subsequent research into Kevlar, uh, oh my God, that's a heck of a name, polyparaphylene terephalidamide, branded Kevlar, was invented by Polish-American chemist Stephanie Kwolek while working for DuPont, an anticipation. Okay, there, there you go. That was where, of course, so stop. But what must have given the uh, information to Dupont? Why would he do that? Like, was course that was his job? Was that he was a traitor? His general, his, the general that he worked for, told him that's what he had to do. He had to just give them the information and then disappear. Just distribute it to uh, AT and T. Got some of got the the uh, the patents for the uh, computer uh, components. And AT and T got some of the patents. I don't remember who got them all, but you have to read Corso's book. But I, I, I yeah, Corso was in the Dupont was in the mix. Corso's book is full of holes. The entire Roswell story, as as far as I see it, Len, and no disrespect, is full of holes. In my opinion, the entire Roswell story falls apart when Jesse Marcel, the base intelligence officer, leaves the base, goes to the Brazel farm, picks up some of this debris, puts it in his vehicle, and. He brings it back to the base. But, oh, wait a minute. He didn't go right back to the base to maintain the chain of custody and evidence. He went he stopped to at his, his... He stopped at his own house and uh, his, showed it to his son. Yeah. yeah, and right then and there, bang, the case is over. Because, Why is that? Because he, the chain of custody of the evidence was broken. Well, maybe, but he wanted to show it to his wife and his son. Then how did he know what it was? He didn't know what it was. It was so why? Of, so the only thing there was one. There was one beam on it yeah. with a lot of very strange glyphs on it right. that he showed his son because it was such a foreign language, and uh, his son kept uh, that piece uh, until he became an, an adult himself, and finally wrote his own book and uh, talked about it. But but Len, Len, Len don't you find it strange? Uh, you're 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 a well-educated man, Len. Don't you find it strange that a so-called base intelligence officer who may have an idea of what he has found breaks the chain of custody of evidence? Well, I guess he was so astounded by what it was, the implications of it coming from another star system, which he'd already concluded just by when he found it. But why? That why, why that, uh, I'm sorry. You know, I, can't, I, can't, I can't go inside his head and tell you why he stopped right. at his own house, but... He felt that he wanted his son to see what he had, because he was his orders were to bring it to, uh, to the headquarters immediately. Well, of course, so he did violate that particular order. But yes, doesn't but doesn't that put his entire, his entire story, doesn't that put him under a microscope that nobody wants to go to? Because, if, this is found out to be in fact, a a missing link in the Roswell story, that this could actually destroy the entire thing. No, 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 no. He, well, the only the, the, the debris field was a mile away from the actual crash site. Mm -hmm. The crash site was totally removed from okay. the debris field. All he had access to was debris field. He okay. hadn't seen the actual crash disk at that point. Uh, he, he just drove out there in the Jeep with, uh, the, I can't remember who he was with, and they gathered up as much as they could mm -hmm. and brought it back to headquarters. But they did not see the actual crash. Disc. But they didn't bring it back to headquarters, and Jesse Marcel didn't have anybody else in the vehicle with him when he went home. Yes, no, yes, he did. He 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 was. His orders were to go out to the crash site. Yeah. I mean, to go out to the debris field with mm -hmm. um, who was the guy he went with? I can't even remember who it was. But the two, of, you know, who it was, though, right? You have that information. No. 
if you want if you want that information in detail, just yeah. go to the Serpo website. It's all there. Okay, it, it's there. All right. Um, Still there. The whole Roswell story is out there, spelled out in detail, on the Serpo website, www.serpo.org, okay. with all the updates all the way through 2016, through August of 2016. But when you've got researchers like Kevin Randall, who is now taking a second look at the Roswell case and saying there's a lot of strange anomalies when it comes to the witnesses, and that there is no, there has never been any evidence found anywhere to substantiate any of the claims that there was an actual UFO that crashed at Roswell. Well, I don't know anything about Randall, okay? I know he's got a, he's got a long history mm-hmm. and a long resume of interest in the Roswell situation, but he's not the one I would use as an authority. I'm Why not? Sorry. Well, he just doesn't come up, you know, to meet the standards that I would... The one that uh, well, let's, that I'm, let's see I find he's most a, interesting would be, would be uh, who's the guy that just wrote the new book? Uh, what's his name again? Stanton Good friend Fried- of mine. I can't even think of his name. Stanton Friedman? No, 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 no. Huh? no. Mr. Mr. Roswell, you might want to call him. Tom uh, Curry? Schmidt? Schmidt, yes. Mm. Uh, the guy that He's was the in... the one I'd go to. Rand- Randall... Wait, wait a sec, wait a sec, wait a sec. You're going to go to the guy who was involved in the the exposure of the mummy in Mexico? No, 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 no. Oh, he was involved in that? No, no, no. Yeah, 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 yeah. I I can't think of his name right now, but he's the guy. Of course, Rick Doty is another one you could go to. Uh, Well, why why wouldn't I trust somebody like Randall, who is a former lieutenant colonel, served in the military, a former military police officer who knows how to investigate, why wouldn't I listen to him? Well, tell me what your hang-ups are about Roswell, specifically. I don't trust anything that Jesse Marcel said or did once it was established that he broke the chain of custody because that shows that he was not a man who could follow orders, that he uh, had you his... Want, you, do want, you do understand, of course, that Jesse Marcel kept his mouth shut for 30 years. You know that, right? If every oh listen, everybody kept their mouth shut until Stanton Friedman started pointing the finger exactly. at Roswell. And exactly until 1978. Yeah, Jesse Marcel said nothing to anybody. Then, if he was such a man of high standards, why did he break? Why did he break the chain of command? And why did You're he? You're asking his, me to give you an answer I, to something I couldn't. I couldn't I, possibly I, know. These are questions that I'm asking. Was. These are you asked me why I didn't. Well, I would say that he wanted something to show his son. He was proud of the fact. I guess he, I guess he felt that mm-hmm. his son would marvel at this because okay. he, he came to believe very quickly that it was not of this planet, not from this planet. And I think he just wanted his son to know that. That would be and like me. That would be like me when I was a cop bringing home a criminal to show my kids. Come on, you don't do that. You're asking me for judgments, Rob, that I could not possibly give okay. you, and I don't even care to give them because they, they're, they're a sideline. They have, okay. no, they have no... The importance of the Roswell but, crash was the fact that, that it contained the bodies of four entities from Serpo, from the planet Serpo, and that's how we got started with the exchange program. All right, now because don't... One don't alien, because one alien stayed alive. All right, but... That's how it all started. But isn't it, isn't it logical that if... I understand the significance of the Roswell case when it comes to the the Serpo case. I understand that. But if the Roswell case doesn't stand the test of logic, how can we then extend the test of logic to Serpo? I think it does. I think it does stand the test of logic. And I say, have you read Friedman's book? Which one? The one he wrote about his interview with with Jesse Marcel. Uh. I must have over the years. He was the first one to interview Jesse Marcel in 1978. And I think it's all in there. I think if you read Friedman's book, Mm -hmm. you'll get as much as he knew, and I certainly trust him as an investigator. You trust Friedman as an investigator? Yes, he's a scientist. Why wouldn't I? Wait a minute. You're not going to trust a military policeman. You're not going to trust a lieutenant colonel who, who, who was part of the uh, the armed forces, but you'll trust Denton T. Friedman? So what exactly did Randall say? Refresh me. I don't know what he said. I don't think I read his book. Well, he said that, he said that there's a lot of people who... I'm paraphrasing here. All right, I, I'm paraphrasing. 
that the uh, the claims made by by people who were supposed to have had information or firsthand information or who had witnessed changed over the years it couldn't be substantiated and why is that single authority of such importance to you when all the other so many others on the other side of the fence well first of all i i've never believed in the roswell crash i never have oh oh so you came to that with sort of a, a built-in prejudice right there well there's no proof this there's no proof of the roswell crash yeah uh, have you ever seen any evidence have I, have I personally seen yeah. the evidence? Yes. No, but I read, Ros I read Corso's book, and I trust how him. Do, he was a colonel. How do you know Corso wasn't going for his five minutes of fame? How do you know Randall wasn't? Well, I happen to know Randall personally. That's why. Well, that's fine. That's and he's fine. not a glory you know, seeker. We all, have, we all have these prejudices, and we all have these favorites about particular people, particular authors. You have to set one against the other. Uh, what, I would, what I would recommend you do okay. when you go to the Serpo website... Mm -hmm. is go to the last chapter called Consistencies. Okay. And read, read that particular uh, chapter. Of, on the, uh, it, I believe it's 32. I believe it's uh, release 32. I'm not sure. But it's the next to last one on the left side of the page. Click on that and read all the consistencies because they discuss whatever inconsistencies also existed. And I think that's, that's your best bet right there. Was there there's plenty of evidence for Roswell? Plenty of it. I'm not. I'm not equipped okay. to really get into that. All right. You uh, know what? I, I'm right now. okay. So what I'd like to do is, I you know, we're coming up to a break soon for our final segment. I'd like to get back to Serpo. Yeah, let's do that. All right. All right. Uh, Exo Nation. Uh, Len Caston's our guest. Et secrethistorynet We're talking about Serpo, Planet Serpo, and uh, it, it's. You know, it's it's a good story. Uh, apparently, Close Encounters of a Third Kind was fashioned after it. No, no. Close Encounters came first. Oh, Close Encounters came first, and then, then the then the Close Encounters. The movie was was uh, the screenplay was written in, in uh, 1977 by Spielberg. Right. He wrote it in one he wrote it in one weekend at the Sherry Neveland Hotel in New York. The movie itself was made in 1978. I think part of it was made in 77, in Mobile, Alabama. So he, he was the first one to release the story, although he didn't know that it was a true story, although he told one of the actors in the movie that it really wasn't science fiction, it was science fact. So he already knew that it was, he already knew that it was a true story. But the actual release of the information was in, 12, it was in 2005. All right, that's stand by. That's when Anonymous sent it in to the website. All right, stand by. We'll be back on the other side of this break. My name is Rob McConnell. This is the Exxon. Don't go away. We'll be right back. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the Exxon Broadcast Network, visit us at www.exxon.com. XZBN.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi Fi, you can still listen to the X Zone radio show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X Minus One, Dimension X. Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. 
Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7, 365. I am Dr. Carl O'Helvey, founder, president of a new cancer foundation focusing on evidence-based physical, mental, and spiritual interventions, including natural cancer cures, prayer, meditation, affirmations, nutrition, and other related holistic cancer prevention and cure modalities. These are used in cancer education, research, and financing care. I ask for your help to continue this important work by donating at www.holisticcancerfoundation.com. Wouldn't you love to know the secret to everything? I'm Dr. Kimberly McGeorge, and on The Secret to Everything, we will merge the practical with open investigation into all realms of the mysterious. We will talk to cutting-edge alternative health practitioners, those who inspire and motivate you in business and life, and of course, we will share stories of the paranormal, conspiracy, and cryptozoology. You will transform because of the frequency I carry, the frequencies my guests carry. Life may never be the same after you listen to this program. For the secret to everything is for you, the listener. For those who desire more in every area of their lives and believe that it can still be found. Listen and discover thesecrettoeverything.com. Little children aren't the only ones afraid of the dark. Millions of soldiers return from war zones with PTSD, anger, frustration, fear, and loneliness, much of which surfaces during the darkness of the night. You have the chance to change the lives of these American heroes. Songs and Stories for Soldiers.us provides free MP3 players for these men and women. With a list of 3 million songs in 16 different styles, 100,000 audiobooks, and 30,000 old-time radio programs, every veteran can find something to soothe and comfort them at no cost. All our players contain an 8-hour audio program designed to help veterans fall asleep. With 1,500 plus vets now participating, it's our goal to deliver 10,000 audio players this year. Go to our website at songsandstoriesforsoldiers.us. Help us help a veteran make it through the night. Our guest this hour is Len Caston. He is the author of Secret Journey to, a, to Planet Serpo, A True Story of Interplanetary Travel. His website is et-secrethistory.net. Um, there, are, there are people who believe that Linda Moulton Howe actually uh, gave Bill Ryan the information. Uh, and this is a quote from, uh, from um, I believe, Moulton Howe. Uh, I learned back in the 1983 to 1984 time period about an alleged exchange program of humans leaving Holloman Air Force Base on, on April 25, 1964 for Zeta Reticuli with non-humans while I was working on a home box office television special entitled UFOs, The E.T. Factor. I was told three men, uh, men went, one died on the alien planet, one went insane, don't know the fate, and one returned to Earth and was given a safe house in which to live the rest of his life in on an island provided by the U.S. government. My main source was Robert Enninger, the writer of UFOs Past, Present, and Future, which was broadcast in the U.S. on television in the late 1970s. Glenn? Hmm. He did say he might have some troubles with his phone. Uh, so let's try it. We're just going to give him a second over here. We're talking about Planet Serpo. And um, 
Apparently, Serpo is an alleged planet in the binary system, star system Zeta Reticuli, 39 light years from Earth. It is slightly smaller than Earth, but has a human, breathable atmosphere. How they know that, God only knows. It is populated by an extraterrestrial race known as Ebens, who live mo- mostly in rather simple villages. The total population is 650,000. Ebens are short and brown. Eben is a term that comes from the acronym EBE for Extraterrestrial Biological Entity. Now, um, but now we go to the other side. This is what hardcore researchers think about Planet Serpo. Project Serpo is a science fiction fantasy launched as though true on several UFO oriented web forums started in November 2005. Gillable UFO researchers such as Bill Ryan, Kerry Cassidy, and Linda Moulton Howe were totally bamboozled by this fiction. Author Len Caston swallowed the story so completely that he wrote a book about it. And as late as 2016 in August, the yarn was retold as true on the overnight radio show Coast to Coast with, and Caston was a guest. It seems that uh, Len Caston is the only person that is... Um, you know, is spinning this yarn, so we're going to try and get a hold of Len again. That's his phone ringing. Hello? All right, Len, we got you back here. Okay, I lost the battery. I thought what would happen. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Len, how many other authors write about Serpo? Are you the only author that, that, that deals with Serpo? As far as I know, I'm the only one that wrote the whole story, put it together. Yeah, I don't know. Nobody else has done it, to my knowledge. So what do you think is going to be the future uh, of Planet Serpo? Uh, do, are there going to be other exchanges? Has the exchange finished? Uh, are, are they waiting for another contact? The, uh, they've come back to Earth eight times since then. That's all in the book. Their last visit was in, that I know of was in 2010. By the way, I just discovered that the last astronaut didn't die in 2011. He died in 2014. Okay. Uh, But, no, they've been back eight times, and the last one was at Johnston Island Mm -hmm. in the mid-Pacific, which, if you look it up, it's like a big aircraft carrier. It's an island in the shape of an aircraft carrier. And at that last visit, which I talk about in one of the appendices in the book, Mm -hmm. we invited the Vatican to that one. We invited the People's Republic of China we invited UN representatives. We invited a lot of people to that particular return. So a lot of people have known about it for a long time. We're not the only ones. Okay, Len. When you look at Roswell and all the number of great books that have been written about Roswell, as well as other UFO landings, other UFO sightings, and so on, how come you're the only person that has written about Serpo? I'll give you. I'll give you my opinion if you want it. Sure. Uh, I went and talked to the head of the guy that does the programming for the UFO Congress in in uh, in, in Phoenix. Yes. Do you know who he is? Uh, no. Uh, his name is uh, I can't even think of his name right now. Uh, he I asked him if he would like me to speak there at the Congress. He said, "Do you want you want to speak about Serpo?" I said, "Yes." He looked at me and he laughed. He said, "Do you believe that ridiculous story?" Now that's the kind of that's the kind of reaction we're getting from people who claim to be open-minded UFO, ufologists. Now, when you got that kind of attitude, who, people who believe who would believe that spacecraft have crossed the the great expanse of the galaxy and landed here, find it difficult to believe that that same spacecraft would take twelve Americans to their planet. Why is that such a stretch? I don't understand it. To me, it makes perfect sense. But the uh, by and large, the UFO community does not believe in the Serpo story. That's the reason. They don't believe it happened. Well, why, why do you think it is that they don't believe in Serpo, and yet they do believe at, at, about the Roswell crash and, and other UFO sightings and other UFO yeah, crashes? It's hard to believe that they would take 12 Americans with them back to their home planet, that they would be that open and that, and that willing to share that, that aliens would do that I guess they find that difficult to believe. I don't know why. It makes perfect sense to me. What does that tell you about the UFO community itself? They're rather close-minded. Um, many of them are. Uh, many of them are too. Uh, are really totally been been totally. I would say, 
I wouldn't call it brainwashed, but I would say that like like doctors who don't believe in alternative medicine, mm -hmm. they just don't believe in anything outside of the scientific community. And really, this story is not really totally outside of the scientific community, because there's a lot of information there about weaponry and, and, and scientific discoveries that we made subsequent to the Serpo story that we never would have been able to do without that visit. How do you know that, though, Len? How do you know that we could not? Is humanity so stupid that we need extraterrestrials no, no, to advance? I was not stupid. I would use the word closed-minded. And uh, also, if you want to know more about that, just read Corso's book. I don't believe Corso. Okay. So why would I waste my time on his book? You're a hard man to convince. Who do you believe? Just Kevin Randall? That's it? No, I also, believe what I, I also believe what I see, what I touch, what I feel. You can't touch and see and feel anything about Roswell. That's right. That's why I don't believe it. Well, then you've got a problem right there. Because do all of, a lot of ufology, perhaps 80% of it, you cannot see, touch, or feel. So what do you do then? You have to use your intuition. Why you to, what you have to do is connect the dots mentally with things that you do know, and try and put it all together. And as the dots start to get connected, mm -hmm. certain things jump out at you, and you begin to see that this is probably what really happened. But you're using probably. You're not well, saying this science, is what happened. We're not dealing with science here. What are we dealing we're not with? with? True facts. It's exactly what Spielberg told uh, the actor in the movie. This is science fact, not science fiction. How did he know that? Because he got the whole story from a, an executive at the Department of Intelligence, by the, from the DIA. And he trusted that source. So once again, let me ask you the question. There has only been... How come there haven't been movies made about Serpo? How come there's only one book on planet Serpo? If, in fact, like people like, like um, Steven Spielberg got the information from a, a high-ranking person at the DIA. It doesn't, something doesn't make sense here. Well, you know, you're just going to have to trust certain sources. Spielberg trusted it enough to make the movie. And uh, Columbia trusted it enough to put up the money to produce it. Uh, and Spielberg only had one movie to his credit at that point. He, all he had done so f at that point was Jaws. So uh, it, took, it took a little trust to go with Spielberg on that whole event. In any case, you know, all of ufology, none of it can be demonstrated as science, mm -hmm. scientific certainty. So why are you reaching for scientific certainty in a field where it doesn't exist? If there's no evidence, there's no proof of the events happening. Therefore, ufology could be the biggest fake news story of the century. Is that what you believe? Until I see parts of a UFO or a dead alien, yep. Well, okay, that's where you are. That's where you are. You can join, you could probably join, uh, at this point I would say you can probably join about 40, 30 to 40 percent of the American public because at this point now uh, it's shifted yeah. and about 70 to 80 percent of the American public, at least the American public, if not the world public, does believe in ufology. They also believe in a God that they can't see or there's no proof of. So what does that tell us about humanity? That we need to believe in something? That we can't take responsibility for our own actions? I think it tells us, here's what it tells us about humanity. Okay. Humanity has access to other dimensions mentally and emotionally that perhaps the ape does not. We can reach up into the fourth and fifth dimensions for information and we do get visits from other extraterrestrials, like the Pleiadians, who do land here, and others, uh -huh. uh, who, does, who do convey that information to us. So it's not, we're, not just, we're not just stumbling around in the dark. Ken, no thanks, thanks so much for coming on. Exo Nation, Ken, uh, Len Kasten, I'm sorry, Len, Len Kasten. He's the author of the only book that talks about the planet Serpo. And uh, if I can find my notes here. Secret Journey to Planet Serpo, a true story of interplanetary travel. His website is et-secrethistory.net. I'm sorry, guys. I just don't believe in Planet Serpo. I don't believe that anything 
UFO crashed in Roswell, New Mexico. I just don't believe in UFOs. I'll be back. Don't go away.